morning everybody i am dr pramod lokande and i'll be talking on cold endoscopic interlaminar discectomy for lumbar disc herniations if you look at the evolution of minimally invasive spine surgery the ultimate aim of any spine surgeon is to do a percutaneous procedure with minimal bone resection and soft tissue damage full endoscopic operations of the lumbar spine are one such procedures there are two techniques available transforaminal and interlaminar technique transforaminal technique is a great technique it is always my first choice whenever i think of endoscopy because it is more minimally invasive than interlaminar technique but there are certain disadvantages associated with it it utilizes the intervertebral foramen which is a narrow window which opens up into a larger spinal canal therefore access to highly migrated disc herniations will not always be very easy there are certain anatomical barriers which prevent direct access to migrated herniations these are hypertrophied facet and the upper part of the pedicle the intervertebral foramen is very wide at the upper lumbar levels but as you come down towards the l5s1 level they gradually become very narrow there are additional degenerative changes which are more pronounced at the lower lumbar levels which cause further narrowing of the intervertebral foramen making transforaminal endoscopy more difficult transforaminal endoscopy at l5s1 junction is not always easy if there is a very high ilac crest the endoscope is downwardly inclined and if you have an up migrated sequestrator fragment in such cases it will be impossible for us to remove the transitional zone anomalies may also prevent easy transforaminal approach transforaminal endoscopy has got very limited mobility as compared to interlaminar endoscopy this is because of the narrow intervertebral foramen and the working cannula which is anchored inside the annulus interlaminar endoscopy on the other hand the working cannula is freely floating in the epidural space and the uh, endoscope can be angulated tilted rotated in any direction to look into every nook and corner of the spinal canal the basic indications of interlaminar technique are all types of intracanal disc herniations whether they are central paracentral migrated calcified or ossified herniations with associated uh, central or lateral recess stenosis are again very good indications for interlaminar technique and all the herniation at l5 s1 disc level where transforaminal endoscopy is not possible are again very good indications the only limitations are foraminal and extra foraminal disc herniations a second relative contraindication is upper lumbar levels where there is difficulty in neural retraction this is the same problem that we face during open surgeries now the procedure is very simple and begins with the docking of the working channel for this we have to mark the center of the interlaminar space in the ap view an 8 mm incision is taken as close to the midline as possible the dilator is then inserted through the incision till it reaches the surface of the ligamentum femur check x rays are taken in the ap and the lateral views and the working cannula with the opening facing medially is passed over the dilator and again the position is confirmed in the ap and the lateral views the dilator is then removed this is a short video showing the handling of the endoscope and the position of the video endoscopic trolley now once the cannula is inserted there are two possibilities that we commonly see if there is a wide interlaminar window as we commonly see at l5 s1 junction levels the traversing route is not covered by the facet joint and here just by making a small window in the ligamentum femur it is possible for us to remove the herniation completely in the second case the facet joint usually covers the traversing nerve root and in this case we have to drill the medial part of the facet joint with the help of an endoscopic drill till the lateral border of the traversing nerve root is identified after which we can insert the cannula inside and retract the nerve root to access the herniation these are actual mri pictures showing both the uh, both the scenarios but with the wide interlaminar window the root is seen here which is quite far away from the facet joint whereas uh, with the narrow interlaminar uh, window the root is usually hidden under the facet joint consider the first scenario with the wide interlaminar window once the endoscope is inserted some amount of muscle tissue and adipose tissue needs to be removed to expose the ligamentum femur the ligamentum femur is then cut layer by layer with the help of a punch forceps 
till the epidural space is opened up. Then the phlegm is continued cutting, cutting laterally till the facet joint is reached. Hemostasis, uh, hemostasis is achieved with the help of a bipolar cautery. The lateral border of the nerve root is identified. The cannula is then advanced to the base of the spinal canal and rotated to retract the nerve root and identify the disc herniation. The annulus is released with the help of a punch forceps to release the herniated mass which can then be removed piecemeal with the help of a disc forceps. Once the disc discectomy is completed, if it is a broad based herniation, you can also access, access it through the axilla. The hole in the ligamentum film is very small. Now consider the second scenario of narrow interlamina window. For example, this is a L45 right sided up migrated disc herniation with a large discal cyst. Here the medial part of the facet joint is removed. This begins with identifying the tip of the descending facet. Drilling is started at the tip of the descending facet, continued upwards towards the upper lamina. This is drilling of the ascending facet. Once the interlaminar window is widened, ligamentum phloem is cut layer by layer till the epidural space is reached. The we continue resecting the phloem laterally till the facet joint is reached. This is to identify the lateral border of the nerve root which can then be retracted. The cannula is then advanced to the base of the spinal canal. Hemostasis is achieved. Cannula is rotated to retract the nerve root so as to expose the discal cyst. cyst. The fragments are released by cutting with the help of a punch forceps and they are gradually mobilized with the nerve hook and removed with the disc forceps. Hemostasis is achieved, additional search is made for any remnant fragments and this is the finally completely decompressed nerve root. These are the post-operative MRI showing complete removal of the disc herniation and all of this has been done through an 8 mm infusion. There is no need of insertion of any drain postoperatively. Another case of L45 left sided up migrated disc herniation. Drilling is started done with the help of a 4 mm oval burr with a side protection. It is, it is always done under very high magnification. The tip of the instrument needs to be always seen so as to avoid any injury to the neural structures. Once the facet resection is done, levum is cut with the help of a punch forceps till the epidural space is open. And it is continued cutting laterally till the facet joint is reached. This is done to identify the lateral border of the nerve root. The remaining part of the facet uh, flavor can be resected with the help of a tube sheet punch, which is like a modified kerosene forceps. Hemostasis is achieved. Lateral border of the nerve root is identified. The cannula retracts the nerve root to expose the extruded disc herniated fragment. This is the extruded fragment which is then removed with the forceps. This removal of fragments which are intradiscal, cutting of the upper annulus to expose the migrated fragment.
and this is removal of the migrated fragment. See the 25 degrees angled endoscope allows you to see under the dural sac and into the epidural space to look for any free fragments which can be easily removed till you are sure that nothing is left behind. And this is the final picture of fully decompressed nerve root. These are the post operative MRIs showing the completely removed herniated fragment. So the advantages of interlaminate technique is that basically it is a very versatile technique which can access any type of intracanal herniation. You don't need too much of uh, planning and minimal use of uh, CM is needed for this uh, surgery. And most importantly, it is a very familiar technique uh, to most of the spine surgeons of posterior process is very common, very similar to microdiscectomy. Thank you.